This is a video about whether or not God exists, but I'm not gonna answer that question, obviously. If you came here for that, I don't know what to tell you, but you're not gonna find an answer to that question in a YouTube video, or anywhere else probably, but certainly not here. I don't have a formal training in philosophy, theology, or anything. If you're an educated person, it may be quite frustrating to watch me stumble through this, and for that I apologize. You don't need to take my opinion seriously. I don't even know how to put on eyeliner. This is instead a video about what grappling with the question of whether or not God exists means to me. How we can kind of get stuck in certain ideological grooves and fail to consider ideas which may be interesting or useful. Sometimes, there's even value in looking at ideas that you think are incorrect a little more closely to ask yourself not just what you believe, but why you believe it. And this takes a certain amount of self-awareness, but also courage. It's hard to look too closely at the things you believe more strongly, because if they're wrong, what does that say about you? But I don't think you need to be afraid. Plenty of very smart people believe wrong shit all of the time. Sir Isaac Newton was an alchemist. And that dude was pretty smart. He invented gravity. He's the reason things fall down. These days, we think of alchemy as a bunch of baloney that dupes believed in. They wanted to change lead into gold and make a bunch of money. They wanted to get rich quick. Alchemy was the cryptocurrency of its day. But that's not quite fair to old Nutty Nudy. In hindsight, it's easy to understand why alchemy doesn't really work. Now, we know all about atoms and subatomic particles, and we've all seen Ant-Man in that part where he gets really small and we see all the atoms and stuff. We have a more sophisticated understanding of the basic properties of matter because of the film Ant-Man. Back then, though, it made perfect logical sense to assume that since things could change into other things all the time, you could find some chemical process to turn anything into anything else. Just a matter of finding the right process. And Ant-Man didn't come out until 2015, so you can't really blame him. And they weren't just trying to make a quick buck. If you think about it, turning lead into gold would make gold pretty much worthless. Gold would become as abundant as lead or whatever other base metal you transmute it from. If you can change anything into anything else, the entire concept of rarity evaporates. Everybody's rich. I mean, what would it mean to not be rich? Just go transmute some dirt or whatever in the woods. Make whatever you want. They reasoned that since God would want the world to be abundant to provide for all people, he would have made it possible for you to whip up anything you wanted from anything else so that nobody would have to go without. Because back then, it was the default position of people who took religion very seriously that it would be bad for poor people to be hungry. Now they seem divided on that issue. The whole lead into gold thing wasn't because gold was expensive. The process was meant to bring base metals closer to, in their minds, purer, more perfect metals, to extract the imperfection and bring the metal closer to its godly form. Something that, like God as they understood him, is perfect and unchanging. Something that is irreducible, incorruptible, immune to corrosion. Something so pure that it actually draws impurities out of other substances, even in in some cases, the human body. Now to us, that all sounds like nonsense gobbledygook, but there was a lot of reasons people believed it, which illustrates my point. Seemingly unsophisticated beliefs may conceal a secret profundity. I don't know why I write sentences like that sometimes. Like an asshole. Like I gotta gussy up this extremely simple idea, or you won't find it interesting, you won't think I'm smart. Look at me, look at me everybody, look how smart I am. Fuck you, me. Which I guess illustrates the opposite principle, that Sometimes they can, you can be a big doo-doo dum-dum and phrase things in a way that looks smart if you don't know any better. A non-asshole might say, whenever you look a little deeper at any idea, it is more complicated than it appears on the surface. Just like alchemists weren't dupes trying to get rich quick, they were proceeding from the evidence available to them at the time towards a high-minded goal that was ultimately wrong, but certainly more understandable than it appears on the surface to us now. I have been, for most of my life, a pretty strict materialist. I believe that the universe and everything within it, which is everything that exists except for one thing, I'll get to that later, obey observable laws. Laws that we certainly don't fully comprehend, and perhaps even laws that we might never understand or be capable of understanding, but are observable and measurable nonetheless. Just because we can't measure something does not mean it cannot be measured. I don't know how many oxygen molecules are in my lungs right now, but I'm pretty sure that if it were possible to freeze time and zoom in and get Ant-Man to count them, 
there will be a number associated. Probably larger than 20 would be my guess. Now maybe this little meatball of a planet gets climate changed before we figure out all the processes happening out there in the spaghetti of the universe. But there does exist an explanation for everything. In, in a metaphysical sense, I don't mean that there's an obelisk with it written down somewhere. I mean that everything could be explained even if it never will be. Things move because force is exerted on them and everything is ultimately explainable by an incredibly complex but finite interaction of matter and the forces exerted upon it. There's no magic, there's no ghosts or angels or goblins or Ant-Man, it's all just gluons and quarks or whatever eggheads say it is, I don't know. I'm not a nerd. I would imagine also that the bulk of you in the audience share this belief with me. After all, we're all urbane, cosmopolitan, educated, intelligent people. <laughs> This is very much the fashionable understanding of the cosmos. You're not really taken seriously if you suggest anything else. A materialist study of the universe gives us computer and big weapon. Every other method produces very nice poems, cool stained glass, confusing ideas, and sometimes, if you're lucky, a profound sense of inner peace. Also sometimes wars. None of this is to say that those methods are wrong, but that for now at least, they're not as useful for what we want out of a view of the universe. Materialism allows us to reap material benefits. Spirituality allows us to reap spiritual benefits, which are very nice, but you can't eat faith. You can eat hot dog made by machines created through the processes refined from strict observation of the material world. You can't make a hot dog from ontology. Like, yeah, you can create the idea of a hot dog from ontology, but you can't make a hot dog that I can eat. And, and yes, I, I know, obviously, every hot dog I eat belongs to the category of hot dog which is established ontologically, but shut the fuck up, you know what I mean. I'm hungry and I want the hot dog. Now, you don't gotta be a strict materialist to be a good scientist, obviously. Plenty of very good scientists believed all sorts of shit that they could not prove. Carl Sagan believed in leprechauns, probably. I don't know, I don't have a source on that, but it feels intuitively true. Till about a week ago, I was pretty secure in my understanding of things. Though I might have hid my smugness to be polite, secretly, I believed that I was viewing life, the universe, and everything from the only unassailable, correct lens. Everybody else except people who think as I do, I secretly believed, was deluding themselves into thinking something which made them feel more comfortable with the harsh reality of an indifferent universe, a willful denial of the plainly evident facts. But I and I alone possessed the wisdom and strength of mind to withstand this discomfort and thus did not require this coping mechanism. And if that sounds very self-satisfied and arrogant to you, it's because I wrote it that way. It's part of the story I'm telling. I'm setting the character of me up for a big twist that changes what I believe and kind of exaggerating the negativity of what I believed before that so I can mirror it back on myself and demonstrate that I've grown as a person. But then I read a passage from the book The Experience of God by David Bentley Hart that shook up my understanding of things a little. Now, I don't fully agree with everything in this book, nor will I claim that I fully understood everything in this book, but it got me thinking. Sometimes even I, dear viewer, can be made to think, impossible though that may seem. Now I'm gonna paraphrase here, so please don't take what I am saying as representative of the strength of Hart's argument, or indeed, the contents of his argument. This is merely the argument as I understood it as an untrained, uneducated doo-doo dum-dum. The materialist understanding of the universe implies a basic causal relationship between all things. Everything that happens is caused by something else. Nothing just spontaneously happens. Everything that happens is predicated on an incredibly complex series of antecedent events. Or as a non-asshole might say, cause precedes effect. Fairly common sense, right? Pretty agreeable so far. I don't think anybody's out there going, I don't think, I think effect comes first, sir. Okay. Since we cannot envision the entirety of the universe in all of its complexities, let us now imagine that the universe is the Pokemon Raichu. We know where the Raichu-verse comes from. It evolved from a primordial Pikachu universe when it collided with a Thunderstone. We know where the Pikachu-verse came from. It evolved from the Pichu universe when the player had a friendship rating with it over 220. Likewise, we know where the Pichu universe comes from. It comes from Egg. Where does Egg come from? Remember that this is the universe. Nothing exists outside of the universe except for one thing which I will get to later. The universe doesn't have a mommy and a daddy. How can there be egg? Whence egg? There are two possible explanations. Possibility red. Egg doesn't come from anywhere. 
egg just exists because either it always had or because some emergent property of nature causes it to exist. Possibility blue. It was laid by another Raichu in an infinitely regressive series of events or some sort of eternally repeating loop from which it is not meaningful to try and extract the first instance of egg. In either case, the materialist understanding of things kind of falls apart when we look too closely at this question. If the egg always existed or is just one in an infinitely regressive series of eggs, nothing caused egg to exist, and so causality isn't an absolute property of the universe. Things can happen without cause, and therefore, the universe is fundamentally irrational. Get wrecked, materialists. If the egg just exists as a consequence of the properties of nature, Okay, what set those laws of nature in place? How come there are laws of nature instead of not laws of nature? We've simply moved the question back one layer of abstraction. If those laws of nature just always existed, then see previous paragraph. Philosophers call this an argument from first cause, except usually they don't use Raichu as their example. It's not so much that this is a question that materialism doesn't have an answer for. There are a lot of questions we can't answer with materialism yet. It's that this is a question materialism cannot ever answer. It is outside the purview of material analysis. This is not to say that materialism is wrong, but that it is insufficient in and of itself to explain the entirety of nature. If cause precedes effect, then anything which happens is the result of a cause. Materialism can trace that sequence of cause and effect, but it can never observe the process through which the first thing goes from uncaused to caused. To even call that a process is kind of misleading. Can't be a thing that happens, because if it is, what made it happen? And when I say first here, don't get it twisted. I don't mean chronologically first. It makes no difference to this argument whether time or the universe has a beginning or an egg. I mean first as in atop the pyramid of causality, the thing which itself is not caused by anything else. I should point out here that human beings do have a tendency to chalk up whatever it is they can't explain at any moment to the supernatural. This is called the God of the Gaps hypothesis. But Hart argues that this specific case is different. The gap between uncaused and caused is infinite. We're not talking about something like water freezing into ice, a change that can be observed and measured and attributed to other observable and measurable forces, like cold or fridge. We're not even talking about the spontaneous generation of matter in a vacuum, because egghead nerds have a pretty solid theory about how that happens. Even in that case, we can figure out what causes the matter to generate. Maybe we can figure out what caused the thing that caused the matter to generate, and so on and so on. But eventually, somewhere down the line, there has to be something outside of causality that sets all of this into motion. A source from which all of their forces originate. A source that itself is beyond the laws of cause and effect, as it would logically have to be, because otherwise, what caused it? Whatever it is that changed the universe from static nothingness to dynamic thingness. So then, if we accept that there must be something outside of material reality, because it is not subject to cause and effect, and also, it's the reason the universe and every subsequent natural process therein exists, Boy, that does sound like God, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like God, though? Now, the obvious objection here, the answer I have always given whenever someone questions my atheistic beliefs by asking, why is there something instead of nothing, is, well, if God can exist without cause, then we both agree things can exist without cause. So why can't the universe? And I was very satisfied with that answer. But Hart points out that this itself is a supernatural belief, a concession that the existence of the universe is predicated on something beyond a material reality. Because otherwise, shit don't happen without cause, and that rather than meaningfully grapple with the implications of this, people tend to kind of just drop it. Once we reach the point of interrogation where we'd logically begin to question, not doubt necessarily, but just question the sufficiency, not the accuracy, just the sufficiency of the materialist understanding of reality, we kind of just don't. We wave it away because we don't want some nerd to tell us Jesus bullshit. Furthermore, Hart argues that modern people tend to view God in what he calls a monopolytheist lens. Yeah, I know. It's as confusing as it sounds. Which is to say that we look at God as akin to how polytheists have traditionally viewed their gods, except with the distinction that there's only one of them. And it sounds obvious when you say it like that, but like our view of God, irrespective of whether we believe in God, is as the supreme being, the most powerful, discrete entity in the universe. He possesses many qualities that other beings may possess, like consciousness or ability to do push-ups, but better, and more of them, infinity of them. 
He is the most good guy, the strongest guy, the holiest guy. But that's not how most major theological traditions traditionally viewed capital G God or whatever we might view as their equivalent, because obviously different religions are different and I don't want to collapse the entirety of religion down to one faith. We might look at them and go, yeah, right there, that one's God, right? We got that too. But they might not see it that way. So just, you know, I'm not... I'm not trying to do a colonialism on, on other religions. According to those traditions, God is not one being among many, not a thing which acts and can be acted upon, but instead the irreducible aspect of being itself, the infinite source from which all things are granted their being. So it wouldn't really make sense to say what caused God. God is not a guy sitting on a cloud. God is more like the Tao an indivisible oneness that is kind of the base layer of reality, omnipresent but not physically extant in the way that other things are. God is not a being, God is being. After all, when Moses asks God what his name is, God says, I am that I am. So God's thing, God's whole deal is that he is. God is that he is. And what causes being? In order for there to be a cause, that cause must be, so be precedes cause, and God does it. God is be. God, God made it. God did that. This alone does not establish that there's logically a God. Trust me, if there was a foolproof logical argument that demonstrated the incontrovertible existence of God, you would know. Religious people would let you know about that. Don't worry. That's a lot of shit I just threw at you, right? is a lot of ideas and probably it sounds like utter nonsense to many. Indeed, it may be utter nonsense. Statistically, some of it must be. And I'm not trying to sell you on this idea. I don't necessarily buy it myself. You're already writing a comment. Why do I bother? Why do I qualify anything ever? You're already writing a comment. Oh, right now, I can feel you. I can feel you doing it. Listen, every fucking weirdo who is ranting about how counter-Marxist I am or whatever in the comments did not make it to this part of the video. If you were sent this video by some Twitter doofus claiming that I attempted to justify idealism over materialism, sorry, they missed the point of what I am saying. Take a breath. The point here isn't that Hart's line of argumentation is correct. I'm not equipped to judge that. There's a lot about it that kind of mystifies me in what appears to be a lot of logical leaps that are probably explained in some of the many sentences in the book that my brain did not bother trying to parse. That my brain merely looked at and said, dog, come on. You said 11 times 12 is 121 in a video recently. Do you seriously think I have the ability to understand sentences like these? Maybe someone who more thoroughly understood Hart's arguments would be able to mount a more convincing counter-argument than I can with my limited vocabulary and education. But I'm taking that on faith, aren't I? Like me personally, I mean, not you, you're very smart. If a counter argument exists, and I'm sure there will be some bangers in the comment section, at this moment, as I am recording this, I do not know that argument. And yet, I don't really believe Hart anyway. On a certain level, I believe what I believe because it's more convincing to me, not because I necessarily have a solid epistemological basis for believing it. Or as a non-asshole might say, I'm deluding myself into believing something which makes me feel more comfortable with the mysteries of an unknowable universe. Oh wow, that was the thing I said earlier about other people. Boy, I've really grown as a person. It is not my intent here to insinuate that either side of this discussion is right or wrong. It is also not my intent to insinuate that both sides are worthy of equal consideration and weight. One may be correct and the other entirely incorrect. I do not know, and you should not trust my judgment about it even if I claim to. I make toilet jokes on the internet for a living. I am not someone who has any business telling you what to believe about the ineffable totality of being. My intent is to foster a feeling of humility, not simply in you, the audience, but also in me. We all gotta remember that we know fewer things than we do not know. And just as truth resists simplicity, so too does fiction. And the categories of truth and untruth are not as neatly divided as we might like to believe. People who believe untruths do so based on sometimes very complex and intelligent misunderstandings of things which are true. Likewise, one could arrive at truth accidentally through specious reasoning. Now, you know, guy, keep an open mind about literally everything. I think we can safely reject eugenics without delving deep into the literature, for example. You don't owe every idea a good faith exploration of its merits while it actively hurts and kills people. Make no mistake, many ideas are bad, and under no circumstances do you gotta hand it to them. But there is always more to learn about everything. There is always more to an idea, even a wrong idea, than it seems on the surface. 
No matter how cemented you are in your worldview, you are never more than one book away from questioning everything. And that's neat, isn't it? Don't you think that's neat? That... Thanks for watching! Oh, wait, I forgot I said I'd mention what's outside the universe. There's the one, the one exception to that everything is inside the universe. Think about non-existence, and, and not in the way that, like, lots of things don't exist, like unicorns or robots or a good Tim Pool tweet. I'm talking about a, a, something like reverse existence, something that, by virtue of it being instantiated, removes other things from existence. A negative force of being, kind of like an anti-god. Hello, Hello and welcome, welcome to the Eyeball Zone. Here in the Eyeball Zone, we all saw where he was going with that. It's Yet another discussion of how spooky the eyeballs are. We wrote it a million times, so you get it, right? You get that he was going to eyeballs. And also, we put eyeballs on small leftist content creators. I think if I'm going to make a whole video about whether or not God exists from the point of view of a skeptic, it's only fair that I let a believer have a chance to speak. There's a problem, though. The left is widely regarded as anti-religious. That we're going to take your religion away. Give it to poor people. The preponderance of the loudest voices in the religious community are terrible bigots, who I do not think get to speak for most religious people, who, to be clear, any way you cut it, are most people. I guess what you could say I'm getting at here is that the left needs a religious strategy. Which is why I enjoyed this video called The Left Needs a Religious Strategy by Tobiah. It outlines from a practical and ideological basis why the left might want to have better outreach towards religious people and the historical factors that led to both our reputation for being anti-religious and the ways that reaction has weaponized that reputation against us. The very even-handed essay that takes into account a lot of factors that have led us to the situation we find ourselves in today. Even if you're rabidly anti-religious, I encourage you to watch this video and have a little think about it. What do you got to lose? Do you have a small leftist project you'd like to see featured here in the eyeball zone? Send no more than one email to thoughtslimeeditor at gmail.com with pertinent details like your pronouns and perhaps you will find yourself trapped here in the eyeball zone. Also, sorry if this video made no sense. I just got prescribed ADHD medication, so it's possible I disappeared farther up my own butt than I typically go.